That's not going to happen. <clears throat> yeah, you should be sleep to like they do. Now they are. All right. Well, we're almost at nine. All right, we're gonna start. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Hi, Asana. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. We have uh, Kim is doing our agenda and maybe. So the first order of business <laughs> is still there. to approve the minutes from February 1st. Does everyone else? move. Okay. Oksana? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody else want to? <laughs> I, I wasn't there, so I can't okay. vote on it. Okay. All right. Motion to pass. Second. 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 Second is our guest today. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Before we look at uh, what you have on the screen, I actually am going to turn on this video on the camera for you guys that are, hopefully you can see my whiteboard. I know that you guys uh, <clears throat> that are by Zoom are going to have a little bit more difficulty seeing this, but <clears throat> when we first started the conservation easement team, we talked about uh, two main things. We talked about conservation subdivision and the need for changes to conservation subdivision. And then we talked about conservation easements. And uh, what we said is, okay, there's an immediate need for improvements to conservation subdivision. So we're gonna start with that. So that's what we did when we launched that in the beginning of 2020. And then uh, I think it was actually finally the fall where that all got approved and everything uh, in 2021. So I took a couple of months break and now it's time to go back and revisit conservation easements. But I put this on the board because I want to show you visually. I'm a very visual person and I have a whiteboard in my office that I use a lot in terms of like doing different things. When we start talking about town of Canada Agua and conservation easements, it gets very complicated very fast. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's where I just kind of drew this out this morning. I want to just take a second and talk about it. So Basically, for those of you, I'm going to try to point here. So we're talking about the topic of conservation. We'll, we'll talk about easements, right? So there's there's two real ways we can do conservation in the town of Canada. We could either do easements or fee title. Fee title means we hold the ownership of the property. Easements mean that there's an easement on the parcel. So then when you break down fee title, there's both private and public opportunities for fee title, right? So private opportunities. Like, for instance, I'll give you a perfect example of private um, is a land trust and Finger Lakes Land Trust, right? The new Vista project. The town mm -hmm. contributed money to it. We have an intermunicipal agreement. But at the end of the day, it's Finger Lakes Land Trust through the land trust, a private fee title ownership of that, that conserves that land. There's other examples in the town of Canada. Well, like, for instance, Ducks Unlimited. It's not necessarily a land trust, but Ducks Unlimited actually does own land and does hold easements. We'll talk about in a second in the town of Canada. Then we talk about public <clears throat> opportunities, public properties that are owned title by the town of Canada. Like for instance, Ananda Parks. Does anybody have any idea how much property the town of Canada owns? How many parcels? Take a guess. Throw out some numbers. 10. 10. 20. 20. 35. 35. Tom, you want to guess? 50. The Oksana, you said 50. Yeah. I, I have no feel for that at all. Sal, you want to take a shot at it? Let's say, go high, 75. 75. <laughs> you win. <laughs> 75. Actually, Sal, win. Sal gets the award for being the closest, but he went over just a little bit. I did a quick search this morning, and I actually found... But the town of Canandaigua owns 72 parcels wow. in the town of Canada. Holy cow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how many acres we have? No. <laughs> so that was just a quick tax map search, 72. Okay. Now, we talk about, again, we're talking about conservation. So that means the town of Canandaigua has protected 
72 parcels. Because unless the town of Canandaigua is going to declare the property as surplus, it is forever going to stay in the town of Canandaigua system. Obviously, it comes off the tax rolls. That's a downside to the town of Canandaigua owning land. But that's any combination of different types. And I'll give you another example of town parcels, right? Um, the, um, well, I'll just put it back here. The uh, Buffalo Street, I'll just write it on here. The Buffalo Street parcel, right? is 57 acres of open space, yeah. fee title publicly owned by the town of Canada when it's leased to Mark Stryker currently, and then he farms it. That's another example. That would be one of the 72 parcels. But there's all kinds of opportunities on those 72 parcels. Some of those 72 parcels are tiny, very, very small. That involves like water lines or sewer lines, or it involves like uh, a little pump station here or there. I'll give you another example, and I wrote this, and, and Karen, you've talked many, many times about pocket, pocket parks, parks, right? Yeah. We need to get smart about these 72 parcels. And I'll give you the perfect example. We're having conversation with Cheshire about the possibility of doing sewer now, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of years ago, four or five years ago now, we acquired through public fee title in the town of Canandaigua, in Cheshire, a piece of property that is right on the go. It's right at the top of the gully. It's the low point in the town of Canada. Well, we purchased it. It was for sale. We purchased it intentionally so that we could install a gravity sewer line down to that parcel and build a pump station. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was the engineering side of it. Now, pocket park side of it, it's sitting there undeveloped today. But if, this, if the Cheshire sewer never, ever happens, we should be thinking about a pocket park on the gully at the mouth of the gully. And again, we've protected that, and that's one of those 72 I'll help parcels. you design one. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> there's there's opportunity. There's yeah, opportunity. Really? So we have a meeting, what, March 2nd with the residents of Cheshire? Yes. So, and then we should be able to start to get some more direction. But we need to, we need to seriously think about the opportunities of the, the resources that we already have, is I, I guess I would say. 72 parcels are already protected. Okay, we talked about the private fee title. So this is just, this is straight out, somebody buys the parcel, end of story. Okay, easement side gets very, very complex, very, very fast. You have both private and public easements. You have public easements, for instance, like, and these are quasi, I, sh I should actually, you know what, I'll put quasi. Um, these are quasi because there's a combination involved here. Like for instance, the most recent PDR that we did with the Purdy's, it's a quasi public private easement combination that was done through this New York state program. And then the town of Canada will holds an easement on that protecting that 120, 140, 184 acres. 184 acres. Okay. So, you know what, I'll put Purdy, 184 acres. Okay. So that one's protected now. That one's protected indefinitely, right? There's federal programs that we're talking about. We'll come back to this a little bit more. Um, also, under public easements, there's TDR. There's also an opportunity for us to have our own town program if we wanted to. And we'll get into that more a little bit in a second. Then you talk about the private easements. There are any unlimited number of private easements. You have land trusts for the private easements. You have Finger Lakes Land Trust, you have Genesee Land Trust, you have the Nature Conservancy. I know I didn't even list them all. There's many, many more. There's volunteer programs like what Tom's family had done. There's voluntary programs where they extinguish the development rights uh, through a different program. There, this really can go any number of ways. So when I first started, when I first started thinking about this, I'm like, that, there's, this isn't a one size fits all. This isn't, you've, you've got to have different <laughs> avenues, which is where the thing that uh, Kim is sharing on the screen, where I initially came up with was that six different potential avenues on what conservation might look like in the town of Canada. Now, why would, you know, look, I probably should have taken a step back here at the beginning. Why would conserve? I put this natural resource protection, obviously, right? Those are things like water, Canandaigua Lake protection, density, zoning, view sheds, recreation, open space, historical and cultural concept, uh, uh, concepts, agriculture and your view shed, all different reasons on why we should think about conservation. But then once we have 
the different programs, fast forward, let's hypothetically say we have the programs, then we really need to talk about, okay, what the programs are, factoring in all the avenues, how they're funded, what they, what's the makeup of it, the different investment, and then how we incentivize people to actually do the programs. And this is, this is one of Tom's favorite topics. I've heard Tom talk about this for a year. Tom, I wrote it right at the top of the list, tax credits, right? Tax credit. There is a New York State program that was adopted in 2006 that allows for a 25% tax assessment credit up to no more than $5,000 if you voluntarily put your property in a, um, a some sort of conservation easement. Okay, what's that mean for the town of Canada? Obviously, that's got to be debated by the town board and everything, but if you're saying a 25% assessment tax credit up to no more than $5,000, Maybe that's something that's worthwhile, having those conversations where there's basically a uh, exemption. It would be listed as exemption on the assessment, um, and we have to figure out that. Obviously, we could always have some sort of local resignation or recognition program where there's plaques, where there's these uh, folks that are voluntarily entering these types of agreements to protect their land, where we can recognize them. Natural resource, there's any number of different programs like the New York Environmental Protection Fund and any other programs to help incentivize for natural resource protection. Okay, I've talked a lot, I went through a lot, but you can see, I, I drew this on the board because I wanted you to see there's many, many different avenues and it gets complicated very quick. And that's why we really are gonna need our team or a new team to kind of kick off here soon to really start to dive into some of these details to say, okay, what is it that we're after? We thought affordable housing gets complicated fast. Well, I've got, it's right here. Right. <laughs> it's right yeah. here. I mean, this gets complicated. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then that's an aspect that could feed into this in different categories also. This, this is an exciting topic, but it gets complicated. And so we have to, as we methodically go about this, we have to try to lay out a program that is inclusive of all of these avenues to talk about what those are. So, all right, with that, let me pause for a second. Let's talk. <laughs> Did I overwhelm everybody? No. No. So, I mean, I was on the conservation easement team for a period of time. So you're saying if you go to a developer and uh, so that would be under the private, would that be under the private where you tell them they, we want a conservation easement mm -hmm. in their development? Mm -hmm. They would get then a tax credit Maybe not. for providing that? Not necessarily, that? it depends. So the way the New York State program works is there would be voluntary credits by the person that owns the land that would be giving it up. And that would have to be worded out into the details, I see, I see, right? I got that. Normally, most of the developers' programs are as a planning board requirement mm -hmm. that an easement. Like, for instance, uh, the planning board just most recently did the morale project at the corner of the yes, point, right? That's what I so there's an open space easement. Yes. So that would be, now wait, that would actually, yeah, that would be a public easement. Right, because the easement is to the town of Canada on the open space in that particular okay. one, and they would not get a, a, a tax. Well, well no. so land? there's there's nothing there's not even draft written for the town of Canada for tax credit. I just listed that as different incentives. So we're way we're still a long way away from that. We would have to word it to make sure that the developer didn't, and in that particular case, the developer won't own the land. The HOA will. But yeah. their incentive, Karen, was increased density. They got to, so uh, financial for them for sales. Right, right. And, yeah. and I was there when, yeah. when that was uh, right. discussed, yeah. Some things do stick. Another incentive, developer density, right? So another question, this has to do with affordable housing. If the, if the town owns some property, mm -hmm. um, can they, designate that property as a basis for an affordable housing development where they would, I don't know how it would work, transfer ownership of that property to, or maybe not, or maybe continue to own it, but designate that property to develop individually owned affordable housing. 
because this is something that they say they want to see. Okay, so a couple of things, and we're, and we're kind of getting a little bit off topic, but on these town parcels, it depends on how the parcel was acquired. Obviously, we're not going to designate Onanda as affordable housing, right? So any parks or recreation parcel that is owned by the town of Canandaigua that has been used for parks and recreation has to, for in perpetuity, yes, be available to the general public for parks and recreation opportunities, or else the town of Canandaigua has to go through a process called park land alienation, and they have to get special approval from the New York State Legislature. So right away, there's quite a few of these 72 parcels. They're off the table. Then there's any number of these 72 parcels that they have another use that is there's a pump station there, and it may be a tiny. These aren't mega oh, pieces of property. That. These are that. these are sometimes they're 100 feet by 200 feet. Mm -hmm. You know, you there wouldn't right be possible. For pocket parks. Right, right. But they would. Yes, yeah. yes. There's an opportunity for yeah. sure for pocket parks. Right. Some of the parcels, like for instance, let's talk about like the uh, Buffalo Street Extension parcel. That's one of the largest parcels that I believe, other than this campus that the town of Canandaigua owns. That parcel was uh, purchased through open space reserve fund money, which means there's a string to that, that it has to be open, open space, right? Then you get into any number of different issues with the open space, whether or not the open space can be used for recreation purposes or not. That's a little bit up to debate, but there's case law on both sides of that. That leaves very few parcels, truthfully, of these that are really able to be developed for something like affordable housing. But even, even hypothetically, let's say there was one, I don't know. The town board is not giving you clear direction no, really. on affordable housing and specifically what that means. That's why there has to be some sort of advancement to them um, for them to make a decision. I just had a conversation with a board member yesterday who has zero level of support or interest in something like a housing authority to further promote single family residential housing. Mm -hmm. So the board's divided. They're going to have to debate yeah. that. They're going to have to discuss that. And then they'll have to give us some direction on that particular thing. So, um, you know, we've talked a lot about obviously the affordable housing in Uptown. And again, there's, there's, um, there's, there's some very small parcels in Uptown that the town of Canandaigua owns, but again, most of them are like stormwater pumps. Mm -hmm. Has a bid ever, I know this is completely off topic, but just a quick question. Would it, has a bid ever regulated or done housing? It could. I mean, the Geneva Housing Authority has a housing authority that's not all that. Not all that different than a bid, but the the supplemental regulations in the state law that allow for the creation of the bid are very specific. I don't know that that would fit in. The LDC could do affordable housing. The LDC has the authority and the ability to own property, fee title, quasi public, because it's an LDC that operates through the town and the city. They have the ability to buy property, own property, and then either lease the property or sell the property. Can they get a pilot, the LDC? Could the LDC get a pilot? Yes. Because I know the town. They can. could request it. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Hmm. That's on Zoom or quiet. Oksana, I think you started to say something. Oh, um, well, to Karen's question about affordable housing on town owned land, um, I mean, conservation program, isn't it to protect open space and instead of, you know, trying to build something on it? Yeah. Hello? You could make that argument. I mean, that's certainly one of the things, I mean, one of the different avenues, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and that's where you have competing goals and everything, but, um, you know, Typically, yes. And then the other problem that you run into with affordable housing, if you're talking about fee title ownership, this category over here, and this was part of the conversation I was having yesterday, and we are a little off topic with affordable housing, but <laughs> if, you're, if you have fee title ownership, let's say Mr. Smith, let's hypothetically say Mr. Smith comes in and uh, the town of Canada says, okay, Mr. Developer, you have to buy, build one house in your development 
that is able to be owned and purchased for $100,000. And Mr. Smith runs right over. He's like, here's my $100,000. I want that house. He buys that house. 30 days later, he puts it on the market and lists it for 350. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Yeah, that's right. There that's goes right. the affordable house. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. that's a concern. Right. That's really a concern. All right. Hmm. Have I confused everybody with conservation, easements, no. fee title, mm -hmm. <laughs> private, public? But you understand how it gets very complicated. And this is where we need a team that's dedicated to this to drill into the details to come up with what a new program might look like. So on the screen here that um, Kim is sharing here, so I try to kind of categorize some of these things, like for instance, the private conservation easements and, and just started to put together again, a little chart. Obviously it's by no means filled out. Um, what conservation private easements might look like. And, and this is where um, we've got to do some more research, but this is where you know, groups like the Land Trust, like Ducks Unlimited, like these voluntary programs, and there's others, Nature Conservancy and many others, and what those types of programs might look like. The state quasi-public easement programs, like for instance, your um, PDRs, your TDRs, those are kind of broken out separately there. Um, and then your FIA stuff, the town-owned stuff, and those, type, those categories probably have to be massaged a little bit. Now, the TDR, we'll go back to that a second. I've had more and more conversation and heard more and more dialogue from many different sources lately about what a, a fee for new development might look like requiring so much money to go into, for instance, let me just pause for a second. So when the planning board when the planning board is considering a subdivision, one of the things the planning board does is they just make a determination whether or not they're going to charge a, what I call an in lieu of fee. All right. And that in lieu of fee is basically the planning board saying, okay, Mr. Developer, in lieu of you having to build a new park in your proposed development, we are going to charge you a fee that has been established by the town board to support the parks and recreation programs of the town of Canandaigua. Our planning board has been very gracious and very, very helpful to us in that what they have done is they've said traditionally, in lieu of you putting that playground in that you may be able to build for $100,000, we're going to charge you that fee, which is great for us because that fee that's established by the town board is the $1,000 that then comes into the Parks and Rec Fund, that then the Parks and Rec Fund can be used for new parks and rec opportunities in the town of Canada, whether it's an expansion of an existing playground, for instance, the new pirate ship over at pirate ship playground, or even a whole new area like motion junction. That's parks and rec money, parks and rec fund in lieu of fees and good job planning board, keep it up. That would be my encouragement to you guys. Okay. Now there's also, we just started this in the form based code area, the town board has established a new fee for any new unit coming online in the form based code. Because again, the planning board is not going to be looking at necessarily subdivision as part of the new projects. And somebody wants to build a 50 unit apartment building in Uptown in the form based code. Guess what? The planning board doesn't have to find anything because there's nothing for them to find. That in lieu of fee that enables them in state law, it doesn't pertain because there's no subdivision. That's why we created a form based code fee, which is also $1,000. And that's been established by the town board. So that Mr. Developer that builds the 50 unit apartment building then has to write a check to us for $50,000 for each of those units. Now, here's the thing the form based code fee has different abilities to fund parks improvements, recreation, maintenance that is not enabled through the parks in lieu of fee. <laughs> so you start to get really complicated here, but the in lieu of fee is dictated by New York state legislation and what can be done and what can't be done with it. The form based code is a fee that's been established by the town board that we have complete control and flexibility of what to do with it. So we'll basically have the in lieu of the fund, what I should say, and the form based code fund supporting parks and recreation. Mm -hmm. The form-based code fund has more opportunities to also support 
things like open space, recreation, combination of different things. So just to really confuse you guys, there's another one, open space fund. So we have three funds that are somewhat, they're cousins, but the three funds are cousins because they could overlap, they could be in the same family, but they each have specific meanings. Then the open space fund. The open space fund is a separate reserve fund that has very specific legislation when it was created and what can be done with it. But the open space fund does provide us the opportunity to either purchase land, fee title, public, and put it into this system, or it gives us the ability to put public easements, which includes the town PDR, the town TDR, any other town programs, etc. So typically the open space fund is funded through town board allocation of surplus revenue at the end of the year, where we put money back in. There was, there was extra money, expenses were held down, revenue came in a little higher. We make a contribution back to the open space reserve fund. And then that way that money is sitting there protecting uh, for future uses <laughs> of open space. That fund currently has uh, give or take, uh, I want to say one, it's a, it's over a million dollars. I, I want to say it's 1.2 million approximately, give or take, off the top of my head. So there's the open space fund. We don't have anything in the form-based code fund yet currently. That's zero right now. There's about, uh, I want to say 400,000, give or take, in the Inlua fund is what I call it, just to try to help simplify it. So there's money available to help with some of these programs and stuff, right? Wow. There's also that information new overload. Yeah. Information. Oh, there's any number of grants yeah. that are also in this category over here. But there's different opportunities here. Okay. So just internally, this is where I talk about maybe a town program. On your screen, you see a town program, town EDR conservation, and town owned program, etc. Now, recently where I was going with this a second ago is I've had more and more uh, folks say to me, well, could we maybe what we do is we tell the planning board that they need to get half of the money to go to the parks fund, the Inlua fund, and half of it go to the open space fund. Okay, neat idea. However, the Inlua fund is de determined and dictated by New York state law. Very specific things could be done. Now, the town board has the ability to create another fund if they want to create another fund, they're more than welcome to do that. Or if they want to create another fee, they're more than welcome to do that. But this in lieu of fund that Parks and Rec has, is, is there specifically for that, for the planning board to find that money needs to go to the Parks and Rec fund in lieu of fund in lieu of the creation of a new park. So, um, so that's step one. And then, you know, so it, maybe the in lieu of fee is changed by the town board from the current thousand dollars, maybe it's 500 and maybe the town board, and I'm just throwing this off the top of my head, Maybe the town board creates a new fund or a new requirement that any new development has to contribute $500 to the open space to split it up that way. They certainly have that ability, but let's face it, Parks and Rec is going to continuously grow. When you have a community developing like us, yes. you're gonna need more money for ongoing new improvements. So where do pocket parks come from? In the Inlua fund? It could, or here, or here. Yeah. Either one. So why have or just the general fund? Why haven't we done a pocket park? I mean, I Can't brought that up that. what over a year ago. Well, there's this little thing called COVID. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we really? do have limited resources, <laughs> but you're spot on. You are spot on. That's why I listed it up here. You're spot on, especially on these. Looking at at least at least look at these seventy two, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Especially especially. Like, I brought it up because I thought it'd be a great thing to have at uh, Pocket Park just invites that's gathering. That's that's the goal of it, to invite gathering of, of people in the community. And if you go to the um what two say 243 over there on uh, in the old list building, they have a beautiful pocket park, well-designed pocket park. And uh I think we should be on the forefront and doing this. You know, now, now I'm speaking for Parks and Rec. You you are. And, Tom, and, Tom's dog wants a dog park. Yeah, we have a dog park. We do have a dog park. 
<laughs> um, but you're talking, again, this is where it gets complicated. You're talking about one item down here. I know. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. I didn't know about all these funds. And, you know, it's, I, uh, hello, I'm a woman. I like spending money. <laughs> oh, Sal, any thoughts? No, I'll tell you, my brain is just like whirling around. <laughs> yeah. How about Tom? You you are the original champion of <laughs> conservation easements and programs. Any thoughts? Uh, one thing that you left out, Doug, is and privately owned conservation easements, the people that, or the entity that donates that also can take a tax credit on their income tax for the loss of value of the property. In other words, what the value of the property was if it was developed into um, quarter acre lots as opposed to leaving it wild, the, the loss of value is a is a tax deduction that can be carried over for five years. So, so you're, but you whoever donates the land or donates the land to be conserved um, also has to have some income to be sheltered. Right. I, I just wrote it down there under incentives uh, income tax credit because that yeah. pertains to everything in, actually it pertains to all of it. If somebody were to donate fee title to the town of Canandaigua, they could use because we are essentially, we're not a 501c3, but we're a not-for-profit entity. Municipal entities are tax deductible. So if they have, as Tom was saying, income to shelter, they could receive a tax credit for that donation, donating that to the town of Canandaigua or for that matter, donating it to the LDC, the LDC, our, our joint LDC is also. That also pertains to all the easements, both private and public. Tom, I'll give you an example of volunteer. I'll give you an example of specifically of PDR. So what happens is we ask the owners when they extinguish their development rights with PDR, keep in mind the state funds 75% of the value. The town of Canandaigua funds currently our policy is $50 an acre. That leaves 24.99999% for the landowner to gift, to donate to the town of Canandaigua, the extinguishment of those development rights. So even in the PDR, yes, they get a check, but the opportunity here for them is they can actually shelter some of that check, that income through their capital gains by, and again, I'm not a tax attorney, consult with your tax attorney, a whole disclosure, blah, 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 blah. But there's an opportunity for them to actually offset some of that gain with that gifting of that PDR at the same time. I think Trump was the champion of that in over overvaluing his property and then donating it to municipalities that when he couldn't sell it or use it. <laughs> Who else? Uh, what else we got on Zoom? Anybody want to chime in? Oksana, you have anything else you want to chime in? We got Chuck. Oh, Chuck, Chuck, on, there. Is Chuck on there. No, I was just. Um, can you go back to um, Uptown and PD and the uh, yeah. um, form based code? So that whole area, because it does have Blue Heron Park, does that influence anything on um, each house that's being built? So every house, every unit, let me say it that way instead of the word house. Every okay. Unit, okay. Every unit that is constructed in Uptown the developer has to pay a $1,000 fee per unit when they pull their building. Okay. So then that would go to the new fund. It's a separate line. So in our budget, in our municipal budget, you see things like 200 lines. And then there's a new one now, 201. A 200 line means it's a capital improvement. It, it, there's, there's capital expenditures in, in municipal budgets, and then there's contractual expenditures, the personnel expenditures, and they all have different codings. 200 is our in lieu of fund, a 201 is our form-based code fund. So when the developer 
pays that, you know, say they're building that 50 unit apartment building, they come in and they write that check for $50,000 that immediately goes into this separate 201 fund. That's how we check, keep it separate and track it. So Blue Heron okay. Park doesn't, doesn't per se have a um, quote unquote um, separate impact, but because it is in Uptown, all of that money can then go into that form-based code fund essentially that is used for parks and recreation purposes that can be used town-wide. Now, additionally, Blue Heron Park has another unique advantage. Specifically, we have our new Uptown Business Improvement District and Blue Heron mm -hmm. Park is in our new Uptown bid. And the bid has some flexibility to make improvements, supplemental improvements in Uptown, <clears throat> uh, those items relative to Blue Heron Park that may make that a little bit more unique, a little bit more supplemental uh, when we're talking about snow removal, when we're talking about lighting, when we're talking about just general aesthetic type things to really enhance that area, uh, flowers, landscaping, all that stuff, there's, there's possibility there. Let me come back again. We, in the past, we have talked a lot about TDR programs and specifically sending and receiving areas, right? That's one of the things you have to have in a sending, uh, in a TDR is a sending and receiving area. I haven't touched on this yet. When we originally talked about TDR, we talked about Uptown being the receiving area, that we were going to send the development rights away from other areas of the town of Canandaigua, like, for instance, the Paddle for Brook Greenway, like the Strategic Farmland Protection Area, and we were going to send them to Uptown. So the challenge that we have now is we've rezoned that form-based code because we've decided what we want that area to be when it grows up, and so we've now implemented the code to build what we want it to be 20, 30 years from now. So it doesn't make any sense to have that as a sending or receiving area now, because it's just, there, there's no extra density left to build out specifically in Uptown. Now, we do still have the MUO2 and the MUO3. And uh, those are specific areas that we could look at where we could designate those as either sending or receiving areas if we wanted. The other thing that we keep toying around with and dancing around is the creation of a land bank. And maybe instead of doing the sending and receiving areas, essentially the sending and receiving area is a land bank where Mr. Developer comes along and they say, okay, there's a piece of property that works. It's in the strategic farmland protection area. We can build there. I know it's not ideal, but we're willing to pay the extra fee to get the development rights that we need in the strategic farmland or in the strategic forest protection area or other areas. And in turn, we're willing to make a contribution to the land bank that could be then used to continue this whole thing, whether it's fee title or easements. Hmm. And, and specifically for those of you on Zoom, I apologize, but we just had a conversation with the uh, Ag Committee this past week, and we're going to continue to look at this area just west of the city of Canandaigua, basically the area going out 5 and 20. You can see on the map here in the, in the room, those soils are bright green. They're prime farmland, and, and they're probably some of those parcels, you could make an argument, are at extreme risk <clears throat> because there's water, excuse me, there's water and sewer in that area. We've done a great job building a community separator in the Paddle for Brook Greenway, really extinguishing development rights of what, over 2,000 acres now, I think it is, or close to oh, it anyway. Oh, it's over. Yeah. Um, so we've been working on that since 2014 and, and making a lot of progress there. But there's this other area that maybe we create some sort of a modified TDR program with the sending and receiving areas, the sending area, designating the sending area as we're going to send the development rights out of this area and we're going to receive them with the land bank to continue to preserve that area specifically. So it gets complicated. <laughs> Every single yeah. complicated. Hmm. So is the land bank its own fund? Yes. That's really what it is. Yes. So that would create another fund. Okay. With its own set of rules. With yes. its own right. Where it could be spent and how it could be spent. Yes. Okay. Hmm. But it would be tied hmm. to specifically development rights. Yes. Okay. Got it. Yes. Yeah, to create conservation yeah. easements right. on land that is designated. designated. 
whether it's farmland or you know open space but mm -hmm. Shauna sent me a text message this morning. She reminded me that I was supposed to speak on conservation easements. And I was like, huh, all right, let me just blow them all out of the water. So I can tell by the faces that I've done that. So mm -hmm. you're speaking my language. You, <laughs> you just found out this morning you had to do no, this. He knew. He knew he just I needed forgot. a reminder. I forgot. You reminded him yesterday, too. <laughs> just <so perfect. laughs> hey, Doug. I'm really glad you said that. Thanks. Doug? Yes, sir. I'm assuming that uh, on our website there would be maps that we could, you know, take a look at regarding these uh, uh, different parcels that we're talking about. Yes, there there are. the uh, You know, we've done, you know, that's the beauty. We've done a lot of the hard work in terms of the planning for all of this stuff over the last five years, six years, whatever it is. We have the strategic farmland protection area, and that's actually <clears throat> the website and all those parcels. We have Every single parcel in the town of Canavagua has a land of conservation value rating that from the open space plan that was done in 2018. So we know by looking at every parcel, pick a parcel, any parcel, I can look right here and see what the land conservation value rating is on this map. That's all available on the website. And then you get the forest protection area. You get the, you can see already some of the private and publicly uh, impacted lands. I mean, really, that's the thing I do love about this room and having meetings in this room when we start having these conversations is it's all over all the walls, which yeah. you, know, you can just see it, you can visualize it. And, but yes, Sal, they are all on our website. Most of all of this information is detailed in either the open space plan or the agriculture enhancement plan. And on the website, I think there's sections under the projects, right? If you go to the projects so for can, some can... of it um a lot of them are under so we have a page on the website where all of our adopted and accepted plans are and these maps are all part of one or another of those plans mm -hmm. um, so they're all in there additionally on for example the agricultural um, advisory committee has its own page and the strategic farmland protection area maps is pulled out separately as a PDF on their page. Um, so yeah, all, every map that's, almost every map in this room is on the website somewhere. Right. Little, little tip, a lot of times when I'm looking for something on the website, I use the search box in the top right corner yeah, of the website the same thing. and just that type in like time. ag, just ag, hit enter. And then you'll see some of the results with uh, <clears throat> different things and you'll see the uh, agriculture page for the ag committee and all that stuff so Doug yes. getting back to TDRs there was a parcel owned by some automobile dealer on the east side of 332 um, what's the status of that and how could we use TDRs to extinguish what they bought is it as zoned as commercial. What's it, you know the parcel I'm talking about? You're talking about the parcel that's uh, the north, the north, the small parcel, the seven acre parcel, the one that has the silos up by Town Line Road. I I don't know that there are silos, and I just know that a car dealer bought it in anticipation of putting a dealership there, but it's never happened, but it was zoned commercial and we'd rather it wasn't. Could TDRs be used to extinguish the uh, commercial use? Kim, can you pull up a zoning map? Actually, you know what? Yeah, we have a new ahead. zoning map. We have a zoning map here, but if you can pull up the zoning map for the folks that are on Zoom, which do you want zoning? Just type in zoning map. So zone or, map. or actually, you, yeah, just type in zoning map. So, Tom, there's actually two parcels. So there's there's a parcel that is at the corner of Yerkes Road and 332. That's a very large parcel that runs to the north and all the way back to uh, County Road 8 in some spots. That's very large. That was originally purchased for a new uh, construction of a new dealership. And then there's a parcel a little farther north from that in the dip, um, on the north side of the dip on 332 that was also purchased by another entity, uh, another car dealership entity, and they had plans to construct. And and realistically, you know, honestly, if we hadn't done the Power for Burnt Greenway at the time that we did it, 
we probably would have car dealerships from from town line road all the way down to uptown and right. uh, that was a that was a huge point in time where it was important to do that even though there's very very limited protections with both the strategic farmland protection area and the uh paddle for Burr greenway at least it, it gave us a a uh, idea of what the town was looking for for that area so right where kim's cursor is there uh, that's obviously that's the Catalpa Acres PDR and across the street is one of those parcels with a car dealership and then that thin blue line that runs from um, basically Yerkes Road North all the way up to Town Line Road that's our commercial zoning so even though that whole area is in the strategic farmland protection area and the Paddleford Road Greenway that first 150 feet plus or minus on 332 is still zoned commercial and there's really nothing to this day to prevent somebody from coming in and taking some of that farmland and developing that into a commercial entity put a restaurant put a car dealership whatever the case the town has not acted on protection of those specific parcels for that so so there's a couple of things, Tom, to go back to your question. The parcel that Tom actually, can I just have your thing just so the parcel that I think Tom's referring to is, is this piece right here, right? Where this little one right here, sorry, I guess I can't. Just to the left of my arrow, just to the left of my arrow, there's about seven acres there that um, that parcel has <laughs> sale um, car dealership from the Southern Tier owned it. Um, that parcel is still zoned commercial, even though it's in both the strategic farmland and protection area and the Cut Upper Greenway, and it's currently farmed. Um, it is my understanding that somebody has made an offer that has been accepted on that land to actually construct a commercial operation there. Now, the commercial operation in this particular case happens to be an agriculture-related commercial operation, so you can make an argument whether or not... Um, but to be honest with you, Tom, this is why we advanced a proposal a few minutes ago for the creation of a strategic farmland protection overlay for the strategic farmland protection area. And you know, with the ordinance committee, there wasn't a lot of support for that. So um, that's, that's the challenge that we're running into. And of course, the reason why there was limited support for it is, and it goes back to the age old question, private property landowner rights, right? not telling people what they can or can't do with their property. But the difficulty is, and that's why we just have had an updated conversation with the Ag Committee, in that area that is west, 5 and 20, basically Town Hall west over to Bloomfield, those are some of the most prime soils yeah. in the town of Canada in the entire state of New York. And if we don't do something, they will be gone. They will be housing. And once they're gone, they're gone. So that's where we need the town board will need to eventually once we get together some sort of proposal make a political decision whether or not they're willing to put those restrictions in place to forever protect those soils hmm. could the transfer of development rights be some scheme to extinguish the commercial use could. Obviously, commercial use has a much higher value than farming, for instance. I mean, I'll tell you, just within the last, um, just within the last 60 days, I'm, <clears throat> numbers, I'm hearing numbers for commercial use specifically in Uptown. Everybody hold on to their socks. And there's, there's no magic to this. I can't speak to any type of authority. I'm just telling you what I've heard. I've heard sales transfer of title in Uptown in form based code between $150,000 and $250,000 an acre just since we have adopted form based code. How do you do affordable housing? But that's a side note. Right. That's a side yeah, note. Right. That's a side yeah. note. Let's not get lost in that. But yeah. Yeah. so in commercial, right? A lot of times, Tom, commercial in the town of Canada, what in the past we have known has gone upwards of plus or minus $15,000 an acre, right? Sometimes a little bit more. So versus farmland, we know has been generally selling in the three to $5,000 an acre range, right? So you factor all that stuff in and, and yes, could it be used to extinguish commercial uses? Sure. It'll run, the money will run out fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. 
That's where it gets complex very, very fast. That's it. Is. There's no easy solution for sure. Chuck has been awfully quiet this morning. I'll put him on the spot for a second. Chuck, you have. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm here, guys. I've been multitasking back and forth. Uh, yeah, good discussion. Uh, the only thing with the TDR, I, I think in talking to friends who have implemented TDRs in other areas, other states, uh, they said the biggest issue is really just tracking the, uh, the bookkeeping involved as far as the credits and the debits and uh, who, how, how much credit is a landowner getting to uh, to uh, to to offer a credit, a piece of land to some other application. And uh, they said, boy, make sure you do the bookkeeping because keeping track of that stuff is, uh, can be a nightmare, especially if you lose track of it. But I think we should get moving. Uh, that's probably the one area that of, of your spreadsheet, uh, Doug, you show that uh, is probably lacking is uh, moving on the, the analysis and consideration of a TDR. Yeah, we have, but uh, you're absolutely spot on, Chuck. I 100% agree with you. We did do the full, very, very in-depth analysis of what the town would look like with TDR that was done by BFJ Planning. And that report is on our website. Um, you can actually just go to the search box, BFJ Planning or TDR. And um, that was actually paid for through a grant that we were able to get and do that analysis. But Chuck is 100% right. And truthfully, that's one of the things that's not impossible, but that is probably one of the most monumental tasks and it's probably where the conversation has normally broken down relative to the TDR is assigning the how much is worth what in terms of credits and that sort of thing. And that's where, honestly, I go back to, I think the land bank would be a lot simpler of a process where there's a fee instead of the so many of the credits because that's where the conversation has always broken down. Now still though, there has to be some level of understanding of the values and how that land bank is created, you know, and, and what percentages and, and to determine that. So is a wetland worth X or is a wet is a, a farm field worth X or prime soils worth X or open space, or if it's got a tributary, is that worth X? It's all those types of things that does get complicated. And that's exactly what Chuck's talking about is determining that, you know, the factor that in. Um, and maybe it's done on an appraisal case by case basis. Sometimes simpler is better where an appraisal is done, not all that dissimilar from the, TD, from the PDR program to determine the development of rights. That may be something better to do in terms of the land bank because again, we just have a 62 square mile town. We have incredible diversity of different uses and land masses in the town of Canandaigua. And so it becomes challenging to create something that fits all of this. <laughs> the land bank with open space funds no this is it would have to be separate this is a separate you can't ever use that for we couldn't transfer it over you could not come commingle no okay. you can't commingle but depending on the project and what you're able looking at you might be able to use money from all four of the funds or just one or two of the funds it, it everything would have to be project by project okay <clears throat> so a land bank is actually the fund Correct. But it's not a bank of and land. you would use that fund for land or for what? For any, any, of, any of it. All of it. Mm -hmm. any yeah. of it. Okay. So whatever you designate in establishing the land bank is what you can use it for. Correct. So we could yeah. really okay. put put it all in. Yes. So that would be the part of the, the of right. piece of paper that describes. Correct. That. So yeah. up in my office, I actually have a notebook of every single reserve fund that's ever been created in the town of Camp Denver with the legal legislation, the laws that enable the creation of it. And then when we're going to look at spending money or something or other, I have to go back through and say, <laughs> okay, this meet the intent of the law that was passed by the town board at the time. At the time, the open space reserve fund is a is a good example of. That was originally created, I think, in the late 2000s, give or take. Maybe it was early 2000s. And um, it is a little bit specific. It actually has some flexibility, but it is a little bit specific in what it can be used for. The more recent reserve funds that I can tell you that I've written the language and that we've adopted build in, try to give maximum flexibility. 
so that when we're looking at different projects and we're looking at different things that we have more ability to use it for the different things. But it all, the, the use is dependent on the enabling legislation, what it was. <clears throat> I've taken up a whole hour of talking here, you guys. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so, but I go back to, we need a project team. That's the thing I would leave you with. We need a project team. We have to re-kick off because you can see how complex it is. We've got to spend some time diving into all of this. So we need a project team kickoff meeting, get everybody that's interested in conservation and learning about all this stuff, start getting them either in a room or by Zoom or whatever, and start working through some of the particulars. John. Can you do this presentation in 10 minutes at our kickoff meeting on the 1st of March? Yeah, you can boil it down. Okay. Our kickoff meeting. Yeah, we're- What kickoff meeting? Right, so that's my segue into, we're doing a project team kickoff meeting on the 1st of March. I'm gonna be sending everything out uh, this week to inv invite new volunteers, current volunteers to come get involved, have all of the teams do a summary of wh where they've been, where they're going, um, you know, what did they do in, two, in 21, what are the goals for 22, and uh, you know, to kind of get everybody energized and excited about coming on board and helping us out as well. What time? That will be here uh, at 6.30 on the 1st. And you can come via Zoom. Mm -hmm. Although we're going to have to figure that out. We might have to do, um, if there are a lot of people on Zoom, we'll have to do breakout sessions of mm -hmm. some sort. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how, I don't think we can always shoot it. I'm not sure. We're but not they sure. Can, they can at least participate in the big part. In the big update and... You know, not sure about the actual teams breaking out. That will happen here, but I'm not sure how we're going to do that virtually. We'll figure it out. So all the teams we currently have will have to tell tell you what they're doing. Yes, absolutely. So okay. I'll be contacting. How many teams do we have? We have I don't have that. I don't think I have that in here. The government page yeah. on the website is already I tell open. You. Third it's, from the oh, right. <laughs> I think it's your third from the right tab. I don't have that on. Yeah. Um, that lists all of our project teams. You're already on it. Just the projects? Just nope. scroll, oh, scroll down. Yeah. yeah. If you scroll down a little bit more, you've got project the committees. Team. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And yeah. the project teams. You can go down further. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. Those are existing. Active. <laughs> what well, kind of active? The conservation kind of. easement team still exists, just hasn't met in a long time. So that's it. Those so five. no, we're at we're inviting. inviting a seat. I have a list. Mm -hmm. I've already drafted it. Um, no, we're adding. I think at least three more. Yeah, I think we talked about that. So yeah. Anyways, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Tree team, history team, conservation team, affordable housing, gateway signs, ag. We're, we're inviting ag, uh, parks and rec and special events. So Karen, you might as well just, uh, I want to you're watch. gonna be here for a while that night because you're on a lot of them. Are you on special events too? Yeah. Yeah. And Parks and Rec. And Parks and Rec and affordable housing. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So it'll be 6.30. So this, Oksana. 6.30, 6.30 on March 3rd. Yes. No, March 1st, 3, 1. March 1st. Oh, March 1st? 3-1, yep. Okay. And uh, what is this about March 2nd, a Cheshire meeting? All the residents in Cheshire who would be inside the proposed uh, potential <laughs> sewer district for Cheshire oh, okay. are invited. Um, they, they're each getting a letter. So if they would fall in that district, um, we're having a meeting to talk to them again um, about their feelings for going forward or not with the creation of a sewer district. 
It's kind of a okay. meeting. I mean, it's open to the public, but um, specifically inviting those residents, property owners, I should say. Okay. And that's at the fire hall? No, it's here. Fire hall is not available. It's in the Onalinda room. Oh, okay. Sure, I have my calendar for uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, uh, at five o'clock. Committee team update. Is that the thing that you've just scheduled for the first? No, we, we had talked about that. And yes, absolutely. And we didn't have, we thought we needed at least more than an hour. So yeah. that is moved to the first. Of so we don't have that. Yeah. No, is, not tomorrow. There is a board at six tomorrow. And then Auburn Trail meeting on the 17th, yes, at 6, 6, 6 p.m. via Zoom PM only. Via Zoom only. Has the agenda gone out for the town board meeting? Yeah, it has. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I didn't see anything. Yeah, it goes out. It's actually required to go out by noon on the Wednesday prior so. to the town board meeting by the town board's rules procedures. Nice. So we put it out last Wednesday noon. Mm -hmm. Hmm. We also have a okay. CIC meeting on the first here for Zoom via Zoom, and we'll be inviting Jim Fletcher to come and talk about their committee. Terry can't make it, he has a conflict. I don't have a, an email from the town last Wednesday. Yeah, it went out. What time was that? 12, right around 12. Sometimes they bounce. 11 50, 11 55. <laughs> MailChimp got posted on all the normal stuff. Okay, I can go on the website and look at it. That's... Yeah, it's on. Does the anyone have page. anything else? If not, we're going to wrap it up. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.